How's it going everyone? I hope you're having a kick-ass week. Today we're talking about two things. One, why would you want to control the temperature of your ferment? And two, how to do it. Welcome to Stiller everyone, I'm Jesse and this is the channel all about chasing the craft of home distillation and making it a legitimate hobby. So if that flips your pancake, if that's what you're into, make sure you hit the subscribe button down below and the notification bell and you won't miss anything. Controlling the temperature of your fermentation is a huge thing in the world of home brewing and it's getting to be more of a thing for home distillers as well from what I can tell. I've seen a few people ask the question, why, how? So I figured it is probably not a bad time to make a video on it. It also just so happens that I happen to have two fermentations going right now, uh, both of which, which are temperature controlled in different ways. So that's kind of handy. I will just say that in New Zealand right now, it is the middle of winter. Uh, average temperature right now is way too cold for most ferments, maybe lagers or something like that if you're into it. Uh, but everything that I'm doing at the moment is sort of uh, aimed at keeping things warmer than they would be in ambient temperatures. But I will also have a little bit of a talk at the end of the video for those that are in summer at the moment. Before we get stuck into it, let me show you what I have on the go right now and we can go from there. The first is a rather large fermenter full of Buccaneer Bob's rum, which is temperature controlled by this little guy right here. The second, honestly, is a little bit of a secret still. I'm not gonna give away exactly what it is, but it is temperature controlled with an STC 1000. So now that you've had a little teaser as to what's coming later on in the video and what I want to talk about more, let's talk about why we do all this stuff. Why do we want to control the temperature of a fermentation? And do you even have to? Before we even start on this stuff, I want to say that no, you do not necessarily have to be controlling or actively controlling the temperature of a fermentation. And the reason I say that is that Thousands and thousands and thousands of people for a really, really, really long time have got away without it. So it's not that you have to do it, it's just that there's a pretty strong argument to say that you may get better or at least more consistent results if you do. Of course there are going to be people that happen to live uh, in climates or areas that have got perfect conditions for the type of yeast they're using and in which case, you know, maybe it's not such a big thing for them. But anyway, let's get into why our little yeasty friends may like you to give them a little bit of climate control. Every strain of yeast is a little bit different, guys, and every strain of yeast will have a range, a temperature range where they can operate in and a temperature range where they're optimal in. And obviously the optimal range is gonna be smaller than the, you know, the total active range, so, as distillers, I'm pretty sure most of you guys would agree that um, probably the, the most important thing we can do, especially up until we fire the still up, is keep the yeast happy. If they're happy, they're going to do their job and uh, everyone walks away smiling at the end of the day. If the yeast are too cold and out of their range, they're going to be slow, they're going to be sluggish, and there's a better than higher chance that you may end up with uh, bad attenuation, so essentially the yeast won't eat all the sugars that they may be able to, or you may just straight up put them to sleep, in which case you're gonna get a stuck fermentation. On the other side of the scale, when things start getting a little bit too warm for the yeast, you can really stress them out. They will be eating through the sugars a lot quicker, uh, but they will also be throwing off a lot more nasty stuff than they would have been if they're down in their optimal zone. Funky esters, funky flavors, higher alcohols, all of these sort of things can happen if we're pushing a yeast up too far above the range that they like to sit in. And if you start pushing them too high or they get too hot, you can actually cook them and they won't do anything for you after they're dead. There are situations where you can use these things to your advantage. For example, with the run that I've got going right now, I know that perhaps I want a little bit more 
funky esters, especially with the Belgian yeast that I was using. So if I ferment it a little bit higher, I've got a better chance of throwing off some more of those banana esters and that sort of stuff. So that is something that you can consider when you're designing what you're going to do with your ferment. So what is the perfect temperature for the yeast you're using? Uh, essentially that's kind of hard for me to tell you because like I said, every different yeast is going to be different. Most ale or brewer's yeasts are normally happyish between sort of 17 and 20 degrees, somewhere around 18 degrees they quite like. Baker's yeasts will like it quite a bit higher, maybe something around 25 degrees, 26 degrees. But it really does depend on the strain you're using, so it's worth doing a little bit of research or at least reading the back of the packet and deciding on what you're going to aim for in terms of temperature. Before we sort of get into manipulating or I guess helping the yeast out with climate control essentially, we should probably have a think about what the yeast tend to naturally do over the course of a fermentation. Assuming that everything has gone smoothly and you've done everything correct up until the point where you're pitching your yeast, you're going to throw your yeast or gently place your yeast into your wash, at which point those yeast are going to start dividing. They're going to start multiplying. Yeah, basically you are hosting a yeast swinger party. The period when they're multiplying and increasing their numbers uh, is normally called the lag period because you're not really going to see a whole lot of anything happening and this is the time where it's really important to make sure those guys have the right nutrients and enough oxygen uh, essentially to create more of themselves. Once they're finished with that they are going to get down to business and start converting the sugar into CO2 and alcohol and a buttload of other things as well. This process actually creates heat. It's going to warm the whole fermentation vessel up, which is something you definitely want to be aware of if you are going to try and control the temperature of the ferment. So activity peaks as the yeast are eating everything they can get their hands on, uh, and as that sugar source depletes or the toxins, basically the alcohol, start to build up, the uh, activity starts dropping off and tapering off towards the end of the ferment, and the amount of heat that they're creating does the same thing. Why do you need to know this? It's kind of simple really if you are trying to control the temperature of a certain size of fermenting wash, the amount of energy you're going to have to put into it or take out of it to keep it at the optimal temperature is going to change over time. So it can make things a little bit complex. At the beginning of the ferment you might be trying to pull the temperature down because the yeast is pushing it way up to about 25 degrees or something if you let it go. That's a pretty active ferment. But you get the idea, whereas at the end of the ferment you're trying to warm things up and keep those yeast going until they've eaten absolutely everything, all of the sugar in that wash, because they're no longer creating heat themselves and that process is starting to make them sluggish. Alright guys, so now we know why we may want to alter the temperature of a wash. We know what the yeast are kind of doing themselves, so how do we actually change the temperature? In a nutshell, you can be as low tech or high tech about this as you want. On the easy side of things, it would be as simple as wrapping blankets around your fermenter to insulate it and make more efficient use of the heat that they're creating uh, to keep the cold out, basically. You could take it a little step further than that and perhaps you make a nice hot water bottle for your yeast. I know a lot of people that have done that, especially for smaller, you know, 20 litre ferments. Uh, not a problem. If it works for you, it works for you. On the flip side, if you're trying to keep it colder, you can create an ice bath, you can wrap damp towels around it, or even just point a fan at the thing will help. Moving up from there, you can start to use electricity. So one of the really tried and true old school methods is to use a 100 watt light bulb, insulate the heck out of the fermenter and put a 100 watt light bulb underneath it or near it. Uh, so prop it up off the ground, cover it in woolen blankets, put a 100 watt light bulb underneath. Uh, get a old fridge that's burnt out, put the fermenter inside it, pop a 100 watt light bulb inside it. Perhaps you could use an electric blanket, a heat belt, a brew belt, there is so many of these things out there, it's not funny. I will stick links down below for all of this stuff, guys. Uh, so if you do want to see any of it, check it out down below. The problem with all of these things is that we've just got a heat source on all the time and no real way of controlling it. The next step up is to use a timer, something like this, 
and essentially the idea is that you're going to set a certain amount of time on a certain amount of time off for any of those electrical heating apparatus that we talked about before but it is going to take a little bit of trial and error to decide how long it needs to be on how long it needs to be off and if you want to keep your temperature accurate you're going to have to be pretty hands-on in terms of monitoring it uh, what if the next night is four degrees colder than the first night what happens when the yeast stop doing so much and you want to keep them nice and warm so on and so forth once again on the flip side of things to try and keep them cooler i have seen people use air conditioning units which is awesome uh, and of course fridges which i'll show you a little bit more about in a second the next step up from a timer is to use something with a thermostat in it so now it gets to a certain temperature you set it at 25 degrees as soon as that wash starts to get to 25 degrees the power cuts off and you set maybe it has a lower limit if it's a nice thermostat that you've got that uh, once it gets down to 22 degrees it'll turn on again and start warming up obviously we've taken a huge step from the previous version to this version in terms of automation and being able to hands off and not do anything about it that's kind of what i've got going on for my rum right now so let's go have a look eh So this thing is an aquarium heater. Basically it's nothing more than a waterproof heater with a built-in thermostat that you can set by rotating the little knob at the top here for this one. For those of you that are keeping up with the channel you would have noticed that I decided not to use this at the beginning of the ferment before because I didn't want to cook the wash and I was having trouble with it in a smaller container. Uh, it turns out that I managed to cook the wash anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Muppet, uh, more on that in a future video. Uh, but I think the problem I was having with this is that basically I had it in a small bucket with only about 10, 15 liters in it. Uh, and this one is 200 watts and I think much better suited for a bigger volume. Since moving it into the big barrel, I've had nothing but success with it. So the advantage is that I can set this at, I've got it set at 27 degrees, or I did. I know that the environment is always going to be cooling the barrel down and trying to make it colder than that. This thing's going to strive to keep it nice and warm and so far it's kept a really good job of getting it up to temperature. But obviously there are a whole lot of different ways to get a thermostat attached and reading your fermentation vessel uh, that is hooked up to a different heat source. There's thousands of different ways to do it, literally. So by all means do not feel like you have to use one of these. This is the first time I've ever used one in a live ferment. Go figure. Okay, so now we've gone from literally just putting blankets over, putting something warm or hot next to it, heating it with uh, something electric but dumb, heating it electrically but with a timer, heating it with a thermostat, what's the next step? So this little guy, the STC1000, is probably the most popular temperature control device in the home brewing world. It allows you to set a temperature you want, in my case 18 degrees. It measures the temperature at your fermenter uh, through a thermocouple, which is going off here. If it gets too hot, it turns this on, which goes to my fridge. And if it gets too cold, it turns this on, which is connected to a heater. In my case, I have the thermocouple and the heater running onto the inside of the fridge. So when it gets too cold, that heater will turn on. And when it gets too hot, the refrigerator will turn on. These things are so freaking popular in the home brewing world because brewers are anal about this stuff. They want to hold their temperature to within half a degree of their set temperature, which I think maybe for distillers might be a little bit overkill, but the advantage of it is that it is super cheap. You can buy the thing sub $20 now if you wait for a deal. You can build your own in your own little project box scrounge up an old fridge and an old heater an electric blanket a light bulb whatever you've got and have essentially a one size fits all solution obviously when i run the big fermenter if i'm doing 150 liters i can't fit that into the fridge so i do need to get a little creative with that and generally what i do is prop the barrel up on bricks, aim a heater underneath the barrel so it's not uh, directly hitting anything too closely and insulate the whole thing in blankets making sure to keep the blanket away from the heater with bricks or something like that. As someone pointed out in one of my recent videos there is definitely an argument to be made 
that a PID may be better than something like an STC 1000. And that is essentially because the STC is just turning on and off based on triggers of heat. So a little bit too hot, turn off the heat. A little bit hotter, turn on the cooling. A little bit too cold, turn off the cooling. Way too cold, turn on the heat. That's that's all it does. A PID, on the other hand, will try to learn from what's happening in its environment uh, and switch the heat off before you actually reach the target's temperature, uh, knowing that you've kind of got a little bit of a slingshot or an ebb and flow effect going on. But that is a topic for another day. <laughs> what I do think might be in the cards in my future is creating a fermentation chamber. I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> All right, guys, I know for those of you that maybe haven't sort of done any of this sort of stuff, that might seem like a whole lot of information. On the other hand, it might seem insanely obvious. But either way, I hope that something in this video has uh, made you think or given you some information that you can go out and act on. If you do have any comments about this stuff, guys, or any questions, make sure you stick them down in the comments down below because I will be around to help out. Uh, and chances are there'll be someone more knowledgeable than me along before me to help you out as well. <laughs> it's that time of the video, guys, where I really need to thank the Patreons. None of this stuff is possible without you guys, so your support and your contribution to the channel is 100% appreciated. Thank you very much, guys. To everyone else, I really hope you enjoy the video. If you liked it, make sure you give it a thumbs up. That helps me out heaps. If you really liked it, make sure you subscribe down below and I'll catch you guys next time. See ya.